Welcome to part three, coupling and decoupling of nations. We are moving to a multipolar world and we're gonna talk about the importance of how regulation can actually help the West. I've kind of asked the question out there as well is, you know, this defense of the US dollar with not only because of inflation, but is it part of this also this acknowledgement that our currency is under attack without saying we're under attack uh, because you don't want to, a lot of people haven't even recognized the China situation or don't want to. Um, I, I think the argument could be made that maybe rates are going to stay up a little bit higher because at all costs, we have to endure a little bit of pain. We can, we can toughen up, but you've got to protect that US dollar. If that gets crushed or that goes down, uh, I mean, the, uh, China owns a significant amount of US debt anyway on top of that. Um, I don't know if that's a factual argument, but I, when, I think one could make. Oh, and also, again, like regardless of intent, I do think that like looking at today's like macroeconomic trends in terms of a US China or you know West China competition really changes what everything means. Like suddenly a strong dollar has different implications because there's a currency contest, but also because what does it mean for exports? Um, and you know, there's a good and a bad there because suddenly US exports are more expensive. Does that help China's industrial offensive internationally? Um, but every one of the implications of a weird off kilter currency environment is one that directly informs the competition with China that's underway um, and how different economies are positioning internationally. And I think what's interesting too, because whenever I look at like say supply chain, I think like 15 of the tankers out there uh, cause the same amount of emissions as like all the cars in Canada. And I remember you saying that that uh, point, and that came from uh, the Economist years ago. I remember saying that in New York, and people were like, "Are you? Is that real?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yes." So bunker fuel is terrible. So you can imagine all of these tankers floating from China and back, and 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 bringing us goods. Uh, that I, I would say, without a doubt, that's changing. Like uh, because people are very concerned about the environment, they're concerned about waste. Is there's lots of initiatives to change shipping and and maybe more uh, uh, friendly. There's there's all sorts of battery energy. But beyond that, that supply chain of getting things to and fro, my kind of argument and thought was, we have to look towards, say, the US to Canada, look to Mexico. Uh, there's plenty of inferred resources, critical metals. Uh, we're, we're a resource country, although one wouldn't think that in the last eight years because it hasn't been promoted, but that's what we are. Uh, there's an easy supply chain to massive technology <laughs> uh, uh, brain power. I mean, without, without a doubt, to me, it seems like, yeah, we're behind maybe in the, in the race, but not necessarily that far. Yes. And I mean, not to be a broken record, although I am a broken record, but yeah, that's another major catalyst for the deglobalization trends that are going to encourage new players to come into the supply chain and enter into areas of it that just have been off limits for a Canadian or a US or a Mexican company for decades. Um, and I think like it's also worth emphasizing that it's not only the emissions of and the costs and the time of getting a good from Canada to um, North America. It's also that there's going to be more attention to the environmental practices um, in China of producing those goods. Like one of the amazing loopholes that China has taken advantage of up to this point is just not factoring in um, its own environmental production practices. So like if you look at, to go back to the solar case, how polysilicon is manufactured in China, it's with dirty coal. Yeah. But, you know, the green movement has just focused on like the solar panel itself. Yes. As that attention changes and people actually start to look at what the environmental costs are of making things in China, that's also you know, going to be a push toward North American production, closer production, allied production, where you can look at what's happening in the production, actually have information on the emissions, and then make a calculus that way. I'm really glad you brought that up because I see that I mean, people look at that, they get scared because they think of the ESG and they think we're going to know exactly where something comes from. One piece of coal in the what mine, which everywhere. And I look at that and go, no, once again, this is actually a good thing because China's been get, able to get away with a lot. And, and my thesis was, and you know, uh, I'll just put it out there. They looked at this as maybe a 20, 25 year play. 
they're willing to do short-term devastating harm to themselves and their country to maybe become the leader in all the renewable space. They're pushing out re nuclear reactors, you name it, vanadium redox batteries. And to me, I think in one way you're going, that's admirable. That's amazing. They can do this. It's short term. You look and go, it's absolute devastation to the environment and pollution. Um, and that also is a hindrance to anyone in the West to go, we can't do that. I mean, yeah. like once again, but um, moving forward, I think that, like you said, that's going to be so key is, okay, well, if it came from this mind, we know either if they don't give us information, that's a, that's a negative score. If we do have the information, then guess what? It's more cost effective to get it from Mexico or Canada uh, because the environmental cost is, we'll know the number. It's going to be a carbon score of this plus this plus this. The cost is too high. We're going to stay home. Exactly. Um, and I mean, in your point of devastation, it's just like the environmental version of a subsidy, right? You swallow a short-term cost so that you can build what for you is a strategically advantaged position. But yeah, and it is easy to put to like, look at the ESG thing in bulk um, or certain elements of it, but there's a difference between that and transparency. Yeah. And a push for transparency is a push that benefits Canadian, North American, U.S. producers. I mean, we've we've seen, and that's what I've been waiting for for years. And it's for anyone who in mining is you kind of scratch your head, going, "When's this going to start?" But we yeah. saw a lot of news coming out from the U.S., like the Department of Defense, looking at specifically projects, and they're not even looking to be equity partners. There's like, here's a grant. I mean, that that just kind of blew through here with not a big fanfare. And I was blown away by that news. I was like, this is this is huge. Now, it may not move the market today, but when the recognition of the amount of money they're willing to spend at, on grants to move this, that's eventually going to hit this market well. And it's a great sign. And and you know, this and the, the sooner, especially say North America, so just Mexico, Canada, and US, strengthen that relationship and that supply chain to each other to to be a formidable adversary, I think the better. I mean, that's obviously my stance and uh, hopefully that's what's going to happen. And I mean, I could talk about critical metals and, and minerals all day long, but I think more people are certainly a little bit more like familiar and you've written about this. They're more interested in say Taiwan, semiconductors. How does that fit in? Where's this all playing in? Because that's a major component of here and that's a big component of your work as well. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, semiconductors are the hot button issue, so you can't avoid them these days. Um, but they're an example. I mean, there are a couple different ways, obviously, to look at the semiconductor question. First of all, they are an advantage, an example of a critical value chain where China has staked out really significant positioning and positioning that went underestimated and actually, I think, continues to go underestimated um, for some time. They're also really imperative for any future economy any future industry. Um, and there's such a complicated value chain um, that it's way more risk laden and unstable than, again, I think anyone recognized or cared about for some period of time. And that's where Taiwan comes into the picture. Um, but I think like the first points to mention are how the semiconductor question and the complexity and difficulty of it right now just underscores what we're heading to in so many other critical value chains. Like, Semiconductors are not the only important things out there. Um, it is a remarkable case study for today's environment um, and what geopolitical tensions mean for production and industry and materials. Um, but the Taiwan question in particular is fun from two different angles. And needless to say, Taiwan, epicenter of global semiconductor production, the cutting edge of semiconductor advanced technology. Taiwan's also a place that is under direct threat at all times from China. Um, there's a lot of hype about the actual military threat. I would argue more relevant is the economic and the political th threat that Taiwan's economy depends 100% on China. Um, there's massive political pressure. There's a lot of co-option that isn't necessarily talked about. And so that means that like this epicenter, this critical node in the semiconductor sector is under the shadow of Beijing. Um, but the corollary be so generally then the narrative is a how do we save Taiwan and b how do we reduce our exposure to Taiwan 
And then the second thing, there's a corollary that I think is talked about a lot less. Sorry, I'm all over the place in this answer, no, no. but there are so yeah. many pieces. There's a corollary that's talked about less, which is how dependent Taiwanese semiconductor companies are on China and how exposed all of them are to China. So TSMC, the Taiwanese semiconductor champion, they have major facilities in China. Um, they have major facilities developing advanced semiconductor technology in China. Um, they have financial partnerships with Chinese entities. And that's a reality of doing business as a major Taiwanese company. But it also means that these are not necessarily, or TSMC, et cetera, are not necessarily companies that you can think about in terms of like being clean in the same way you can think about, there are obviously issues also with the North American equivalents, but yeah. it's a different story. Um, yes. And that complicates the calculus as well. That does, because I mean, I've heard people say, listen, if you could just take TMAC out of Taiwan, say you and all your family, just move them to Texas. <laughs> there, we solved the problem. But you don't really, uh, that's, that, that might solve some, uh, but not, not all. We know that yeah, TMAC is building out like um, plants or sorry, uh, you know, gigafactories in the US, but those are also, they take a long time and they cost a lot of money. Yes. And the other thing is the semiconductor value chain is a complicated one. And part of the reason that they, and really, you know, we'll be honest, like most other international semiconductor companies have exposures to China. And they have exposures to China because Beijing might not have the most advanced semiconductor technology in the world, but they're very, very strong when it comes to the upstream inputs that go into semiconductors. And they're the only ones who are producing things that use semiconductors. So a semiconductor, like a major semiconductor company's many of their major suppliers are going to be Chinese and their ultimate customers are Chinese. And if that's the environment, then the answer to concern over the semiconductor industry is not just to put money into the direct obvious semiconductor industry. And it's not, you can't just take TSMC and move that, right? Yep. You have to think about the entire value chain and you have to think about the upstream and downstream, which I guess goes back to the initial point that it's more like this is not the only thing that matters. And it's not the only thing that matters both in terms of other sectors, but also in terms of above and below it in the value chain.